Today's Basic Bytes was inspired by a recent episode of 8-Bit Show and Tell. We are going to be using Epic's Toolkit Basic to test some joysticks and to benchmark our joystick testing code, thus resulting in a joystick tester program that you will be able to download in a D64 file, along with all of the other code examples appearing in this video. Greetings, it's JC at Basic Bytes. In today's programming video, we are interfacing with the Commodore 64's joystick ports and benchmarking our joystick testing code using the Epix Programmer's Basic Toolkit. This product's sales pitch is assembly language graphics with basic convenience, and indeed, it is one of my favorite program development environments to recommend to basic programmers, such as myself, who wish to exploit more of the Commodore 64's sound, graphics, and game controller capabilities without having to pull out the dreaded assembler. This video was directly inspired by an 8-bit show and tell episode entitled Printing Binary in Basic and Assembly on Commodore 64 in April of 2022. The purpose of that video was essentially to read the input from a joystick and then print it out as a binary number as efficiently as possible. If you're wondering why someone would wish to do this, let me catch you up quickly with the one-line program that you see on the screen right now. This one-liner is an infinite loop that simply peeks at memory location 56320 and prints it out on the screen. That memory location is special because that byte of memory is not mapped to RAM. Rather, it is mapped directly to joystick port number 2 and will tell us about any input or lack thereof that is registering on that joystick port. As demonstrated here. As long as I am not pushing any buttons on the controller, it's reading out a value of 127. However, Pushing the fire button changes the value, as does moving the joystick up, down, left, right, and any combination of those things. Now, if you're trying to use a loop like this to test a joystick, the tricky part is deciphering what exactly the numbers mean. The memory location is, of course, being printed out by the Commodore 64 as a byte value in the range of 0 to 255. The Commodore 64, of course, regards this as a binary number. When you push the fire button, or up, down, left, or right, what is actually happening is that individual bits within this byte are flipping on and off for each of those things. If we could output the status of the joystick port as a binary number, it would provide us with some very useful information, as then we could see the individual ones and zeros flipping on and off like little switches. Thus, in the 8-bit show and tell video, Host Robin was trying to benchmark the most efficient way to do that in both basic version 2 and in machine language. The part of his video that really caught my attention was when he mentioned that prior to making it, he had looked for a basic extension that had a binary number conversion function and was unable to find one. That was accompanied by a footnote that he later realized such a function existed in the extension to Simon's Basic. I was also unaware that such a thing existed in Simon's Basic, what came into my mind was Epic's Toolkit Basic. This lovely product has built-in functions to convert decimal to and from binary, hexadecimal, and octal if you've gone completely mad. These are functions that are easily overlooked because they only appear on page 12 of the manual under a heading entitled Making Conversions. 
For whatever reason, none of these functions appear in the manual's alphabetical list of commands or on the quick reference card. In all fairness, there are certain hidden commands in Epic's Toolkit Basic that very rightfully did not appear in print, and if you'd like to know more about those, check out my recent video, F-Bombs and Other Easter Eggs in Epic's Toolkit Basic. These, however, in my opinion, should have been included on the master list. In addition to the bin string function for binary conversions, the toolkit also contains a joy function which is specifically tailored for reading the joystick ports in a programmer-friendly way. In the remainder of this video, I will be demonstrating and benchmarking code examples that use both the bin string function and the joy function. For the first example, I'm using the exact same framework that 8-bit show Intel did. This seems logical seeing as there is benchmarking involved. We begin by printing character string 147, which clears the screen. Setting the system variable ti string to zeros essentially resets the system's infinitely running internal jiffy clock, and this is the start of our benchmarking timer. For the benchmark, we're going to loop 256 times from 0 to 255. Being that we're in BASIC, there actually is nothing magic about the number 256 in terms of how many times we go around, but we will preserve that number for comparative benchmarking, and also, it seems to be a good number that runs just long enough that we can get some reasonable results. In the next two lines, we set the variable a to the value of x and then print it out, which simply tells us which iteration of the loop we are currently on. You may be asking yourself, why not just print out x? Well, the initial idea was that the variable a would be able to be manipulated for testing various binary conversion routines without messing up the value of x, upon which the loop itself depended. Obviously, the variable a has no real purpose at this juncture, and we will clean it up in the next example. Down here at line 200 is where our actual code goes. We peek the value of memory location 56320, which is joystick port number 2, and then we run it through our bin string function in order to give us a binary number. And since we have that function, the entirety of our code is this one line. We finish looping through the loops, and then finally, we divide the system variable ti, which is the jiffy clock, by 60 to tell us how many seconds our benchmark ran, given that there are 60 jiffies in one second. With my joystick in hand, we will now run this. And you can see as I push the fire button or move the joystick up, down, left, right, or any combination of these things, that the binary number flips around to show us exactly which bits are on and off. Total runtime, less than 15 seconds, which is an excellent result. I'm not going to spoil all of the results that Robin achieved in case you haven't seen his video yet, but suffice it to say that the bin string function has just proven itself as being a worthy solution and indeed runs at machine language speed because it is indeed a machine language function. With all of that said, we are far from finished, and at the present time, we haven't even really optimized the code that we have, so let's do that next. For our next binary example, I have simply optimized the existing code. One of the first things you will notice on line 110 is that instead of printing character string 147 to clear the screen, I am now issuing the reset command. The reset command will be appearing in every subsequent example from here on out, and in addition to clearing the screen, it sets all graphic, sound, and sprites to their default values as demonstrated here. In fact, it even takes you right back to the stock blue and sky blue of the normal Commodore 64. 
This is one of the key commands in Epic's Toolkit Basic, as it's considered good practice to run it at the start of any program. Running the reset command in immediate mode as I just did is slightly different than doing a warm start by holding down the stop key and pressing restore, which kicks you back into the monochrome color scheme of Epic's Toolkit Basic. With, of course, all of your code still intact in memory. Throughout this video, we will be jumping back and forth between the two color schemes just to give it a bit more of an interesting aesthetic. After the reset command, poking location 646 with 15 simply sets the text color to light gray for better readability. Next, I assign the memory locations of joystick ports 1 and 2 to the variables J1 and J2. Conventional wisdom says that peaking J2 will execute just a bit faster than peaking 56320 on every iteration of the loop. As for our benchmark, the entire loop is now down to one line of code here at 160, where all we need to do is print X for the current iteration, and then we peak joystick port 2 and convert it to binary. So, with joystick back in hand, let's see what happens with this one. It's very much like the last one, except for the changed color scheme naturally, and seems to be responding at about the same speed, although I suspect it is actually now running a little bit faster due to the optimizations we made, and there it is, 13.16 seconds, so we've taken off in the range of a couple of seconds of execution time with our optimizations. Those optimizations, however, cannot hold a candle to the major wastage of CPU that is currently happening in this example, and that is happening due to the screen scrolling. With the code as it is presently, once the initial screen fills up, every additional line that gets written to the screen has to task the CPU with taking the bottom 24 lines of data on the screen and shifting them up by one, which is burning a lot of CPU time, and it gives us nothing except for what looks like a bad 8-bit version of an endlessly scrolling Guitar Hero. All we really need to know is what buttons are currently being pressed on the joystick, and therefore we could save ourselves quite a lot of CPU if we just wrote the value to one location on the screen and then continuously updated it in that one location instead of doing the endless scroll. It's not that hard to do, and that's our next example. For our third binary example, to eliminate all of the unnecessary screen scrolling and just get a constantly updating value, all we have to do is alter line 160. Instead of print, we say print at 1, 2 as my chosen location. These here are X and Y coordinates. The 1 is column and the 2 is row. 1, 1 would be the very upper left corner of the screen. This sort of thing is also quite easy to achieve in the stock basic version 2. Even though there is no print at command, you can simply print a home character and some cursor characters to constantly put your cursor back to the location on screen that you want to update, or if that becomes unwieldy because the location is too far down the screen, a couple of pokes will also relocate your cursor anywhere on the screen that you wish. However, Epic's Toolkit Basic has the print at command, which is highly convenient, and so we're going to use it. And so, once again, with our joystick in hand, we should now see a single constantly updating value, rather than a constantly scrolling value, running now. And there we go, up, down, left, right, and any combination with the fire button. And there we have it, 6.38 seconds. In other words, no matter how much we tried to optimize the binary function or the running of that function, half of the CPU time approximately in our prior example was being burnt on doing absolutely nothing other than scrolling the screen up. 
Given that with this example we have essentially taken our best time and then cut it in half, my next thought is, why not extend this to simultaneously test both joystick ports? And that's our next example. This fourth binary example will be our last one that uses the bin string command before I switch over to using the joy command, which is the toolkit's built-in function that is actually intended for the purpose of reading the joystick port. Here in this code, I've only added a couple of things to the last example. First of all, since we are going to be printing out both joystick ports, I have added line 140 as a heading to tell us which number is which. It only needs to be printed out once, and therefore it is printed outside of the loop. Within our loop, I have simply extended the line so that we print our iteration, then the binary converted value of joystick port 1, then the binary converted value of joystick port 2. Now for the running of this example and subsequent examples that use two joysticks, it should be noted that I don't have joysticks plugged into both of the joystick ports on my Commodore 64, but what I do have is a digital joystick port changer. So what I will do as this test runs is I will occasionally press the button on my joystick port switcher, which will flip my joystick back and forth from registering as port number one and port number two. With that in mind, let's give this a run. And so we are in joystick port two, switching the button. And we are now reading from joystick port number one and switching back, 9.16 seconds, continuously running tests of both joystick ports, and we've just accomplished it in less than 10 seconds. As mentioned though, I'd now want to get away from using the bin string function and begin using the joy function, which is what we are actually going to use in our final joystick testing program. The first benchmark of the joy command is almost identical to one of the code examples you've already seen, except here in line 140, instead of peaking the joystick port and then running it through bin string, we are simply running joy with an argument of two. Naturally, this function will take an argument of one or two, depending upon which joystick port you wish to query it returns a numeric value from 1 through 9, which correspond to the nine possible positions that the joystick can be in. Further to that, if it is a negative 1 through 9, that means that the fire button is at that moment being pressed. For clarity, let's run this example. As you can see, the number is flipping through values, and each time you see a negative is me clicking the fire button. Seven and a half seconds, which is also a fantastic time. You may indeed point out that this benchmark is in fact slightly slower than the equivalent bin string benchmark. However, that is offset by the fact that the joy command is crafted to return a value that is more immediately programmatically useful than a long string of zeros and ones. For the record, the joy command returns a value which is structured like a standard number pad on a computer. So if you look at the number input pad, for example, on the Commodore 128, five is in the middle, which means the joystick is not being pushed in any direction. 8 is up, 2 is down, 7 is the upper left, and so on and so forth. In any case, now that we have a value from 1 through 9, which may be negative or may be positive, let us take a look at a couple of ways that we can manipulate that into something that is slightly more human readable. On page 78 of the Epics Programmer's Basic Toolkit Manual, we see the following example test code for the joy function, which I will modify in a couple of small ways. First of all, we're going to read joystick port 2, which is our preferred port. And second of all, there's actually an error in the code as it appears in the manual. This second equals is a typo. 
if you get rid of that extraneous equal sign, the code will function as intended. This code harkens back to the screen scrolling of our initial binary examples, but presents the information in a bit of a different format. Every time you press the fire button, zap appears on the screen. The two values that you see scrolling are x and y. So left is minus 1 and right is 1 on the x axis, and similarly, 1 is up on the y axis and minus 1 is down on the y axis, and these two numbers will continue to show us which axes are being activated at any given moment, along with printing zap whenever the fire button is pressed. Ultimately, I already know exactly how I want to process the joystick port information for the user, and this isn't it. However, since these formulas do exist as an official example in the manual, I thought, why not plug them into our benchmark and see how they perform? For our second benchmark of the joy command, I have thus implemented the math formulae from page 78 of the manual. Of course, for the benchmark, we're going to use print at rather than the endless scroll, so I have included on line 120 some helpful headings so that we know what the information is that we're looking at. Within the loop, we get the value of joystick port 2 into variable j, and then to print out the information, the first thing we need to handle is the fire button. If the value of j is less than zero, meaning it's a negative number, that means the fire button is being pressed. So, in that instance, we print out zap, and then we set j to the negative of itself, because a negative of a negative is a positive. Therefore, after line 170, we have a positive value 1 through 9 in variable j, regardless of whether or not it was negative to begin with. If j is not less than zero, that means that the fire button is not being pressed. In other words, we have a positive number, and that brings us to this lovely else command, which is part of the Epic's basic toolkit. In normal basic, we would have to use a multiple if structure or something of that kind in order to handle this, but in this case, we can simply do an if else. Else, we're going to print four spaces, which is the same column width as zap exclamation mark to ensure that if the fire button is not being pressed, that the word zap is blanked out on the next iteration of the loop. Then we have the X and Y formulas that were contained within the manual. Rest assured, I am not going to take the time right now to try to wrap your head or mine around exactly how these work. However, if you're the sort that likes math puzzles, you might want to stare at these for a little while and figure out exactly how these take a value from 1 through 9 and change them into a 1 or a negative 1 on both the x and y axes. So let's put these math formulae to the test and see what kind of numbers we achieve. And we have the x direction, y direction, and zap all running nicely on the same line, although it already appears to be running a bit slower than previous iterations. 14.76 seconds. Not at all a bad time in the grand scheme of this experiment, However, not at all a good time in relation to some of the times that we have already been able to achieve. The reason for this, of course, is that BASIC is slow. So even though the JOY function is a machine code function, all of the subsequent math that we are having the BASIC interpreter do is really slowing this down. So it was a worthy test, but we won't be sticking with this going forward. Instead, well, let's go to the next example. Our third and penultimate benchmark of the joy command implements the method that will actually be used in the final joystick testing program, and since the code is now longer than a screenful, I will show it to you in two halves. This 
first half is the setup portion, for lack of better words. And that's essentially it. It's a nine element array. And yes, I know that it's actually a 10 element array because the arrays begin at zero, but let's say that it's an array of nine useful elements. These are, of course, human readable strings corresponding to each of the values returned by the joy command one through nine. And they are all the exact same column width to ensure that in each iteration of the loop, any old data gets overwritten. So they all need to be the width of the longest element, which happens to be downright, which I suppose you could therefore say is downright long. <laughs> uh, okay, anyhow. In terms of testing in BASIC, using a lookup array actually produced one of the fastest benchmarks in the 8-bit show and tell video. However, this is where we see the advantage of the joy command versus using binary numbers, because the binary version had to pre-calculate every possible binary combination before beginning the testing loop, and that actually front-loaded the program with quite a long initialization time, even though the benchmark of the loop itself then ran quite fast. In this case, with only nine values, there is absolutely no pre-calculation time. We simply define each one of them to exactly what we wish it to be and run the results of the joy function through it. Speaking of that, let's take a look at the second half of the program. So here we have a very simple loop. As before, we read joystick port 2, we do our print at, then we still need to handle negative numbers for the pressing of the fire button. So if j is less than 0, print zap, make j positive, else just print a blank, and then all we simply do is run j, which is the result of the joy function, through j string, which is the array of strings that we set up in the first half of this program, and Bob's your uncle. While we're on the subject of arrays, I will also mention as food for thought that translating the output of the joy function into something human readable is actually one of the least creative things that you could do with this. If you were to use a numeric array, you could in fact translate the output of the joy function into any set of numbers that you wish, be it synchronizing it with the joy command that's in BASIC 7 as exists in the Commodore 128, or according to any other set of numeric values that may work with whatever formula or algorithm your program happens to be using. Therefore, instead of using a string array to translate into human-readable values, you could use a numeric array as a translation layer to make the joy function return any set of number values that you wish under any circumstances in your program. With all of that said, I'm sure you want me to just run the benchmark already, and here we go. Now we have zaps, we have named directions as I push the joystick around, we're running at an excellent clip, and we have outputted human-readable joystick directions, 256 iterations in less than 10 seconds. But I did mention that this was the penultimate example, because much like our penultimate binary example, I got to thinking, if the results are this good just reading out of one of the joystick ports, why not both? In our last and final benchmark, we have the exact same lookup array as before, but our main code has been expanded to handle both joystick ports. For optimal efficiency, the column headers as well as the port 1 and port 2 row headers are only ever printed to the screen once. And then, as we go through the loop, we use the print at command as well as the positioning being afforded to us by the 
comma between print statements, which is essentially telling the cursor to move in one tab, to update just the contents of the quote-unquote cells where the information should go. This loop essentially runs through the same logic twice, where we read a joystick port, check if it's less than zero to handle the fire button, and then simply run the results of the joy function through our JString lookup array to get human readable output. Once again, I only have a joystick plugged into port number two, but as I run the benchmark, I will be pressing the button on my joystick port switcher in order to flip my joystick to port one and then back to port two. So presently we are in port number two, switching to port number one, and back to port number two. 15 and 1 third seconds for a complete test of both joystick ports in human readable format. As far as I'm concerned, this gives us the best balance of speed and functionality, but there is one remaining thing that bothers me, and that is this little number 255 sitting right up here. In every single example so far, we have been counting iterations, which is also burning CPU time. Granted, the effect of this is nowhere as impactful as, say, the screen scrolling that we eliminated, but when you think about writing a final program for joystick testing, we're not going to be counting iterations, we're simply going to be running an infinite loop until the user instructs the computer to break out of it. Therefore, this iteration counter itself is wasted CPU within the benchmark. So let's handle that right now. Line 360 prints X, which is the loop counter, and so we're going to delete it right now. And with line 360 gone, let's see what that does to the time of our final benchmark and perceptively how long 15 seconds is if there isn't a counter running. Once again, running in port number two, switching to port number one, and back to port number two. 12 and one half seconds is our final time, and we now have the code that is the basis of our final program. To wrap things up on today's video, here are the contents of the D64 disk image, which has been released as Basic Bytes 220521 and is now available for download at files.basicbytes.ca. You will notice that it contains all eight code examples from today's video, as well as a ninth file entitled Joy Test Source, containing the code for the final joystick testing program. As is mentioned in the note on screen, you will obviously need your own copy of the Epix Programmer's Basic Toolkit in order to be able to load and make use of any of these nine examples. However, a copy of the toolkit is not required to load and run the very first program on the disk, which is simply entitled JoyTest. This is what the toolkit calls an auto-booting disk. If you simply load star comma eight comma one, it will load a runtime version of the toolkit, which does not allow the end user to edit code, and then it will automatically start up your Epix Basic Toolkit program, thus allowing you to distribute your programs to anyone who has a Commodore 64. And here for demonstration purposes is my final joystick testing program, which continuously pulls the status of joystick port number one and joystick port number two. Having a reset button on your Commodore 64 is of course highly recommended, but in the event that you don't, pressing Q will cleanly exit and restart your computer.
If you are curious to know what else the Epix Programmer's Basic Toolkit can do with joystick ports, I recommend you check out the Pad X, Pad Y, and Pad B commands, which read the X and Y coordinates and buttons from input devices such as graphics tablets. In the meantime, if you found this interesting or entertaining, please like and subscribe to Basic Bytes for more. Also, if you haven't seen the 8-bit show-and-tell video that prompted this one, I highly recommend you check out that channel as well. Thank you for watching.